really great to connect. I love <laughs> this book. This is a great book. Um, very, very unique. But before I ask you about it, how's your day going? The day is going good. I was I had a lot of anxiousness with this, <laughs> with the Zoom. You made it happen. You look great. You got a cool background. Is that your office or is that home? That's home, yes. I mean, the office is on the other side. I, I got that set up for another broadcast. For sure. Stuff. Well, but, well, your home yeah, looks cool and colorful. Shirt and, and the background here with the poster of all of the players. Wow. Okay. That's how the tree, that's, that's how the tree of life is sure. for NBA players. Yeah. Well, your book talks about the highs and the lows of your career and all that. But before I get into that, I'm very curious about the format of your book. Most books that are biographies are in the words of the person who lived it. Yours is kind of like a collection of articles where you're being totally quoted but it's very long form and all that. Who came up with that format? Was it Mark and Gary? That's Mark and Gary. Yeah. And along with me, of course, you know, but uh, we sat down, put it all together and put a format together. And then we followed it to the max. And we tried to be totally honest. No <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> you know, everybody tried to hide and clean up and make, make things look great. But no, we were straight up. It's such a unique format because it's, it's kind of like between an, a regular memoir and an oral history. I've yeah. never seen a book in that format before. How did that happen? Did they originally come to you and say, hey, we want a biography and you came up with that format? No, well, no, no. Uh, Triumph Books and along with David Stern, the late David Stern and Charlie Rosenzweig, we, we sat down and came up with a deal for the book. And then we had to research out who we wanted to write this book. And Mark Spears and I had been talking and talking and trying to figure out something we need to do later on in life. And we said, hey, look at this, look at this project. And he took a look at it. And for, unfortunately, and fortunately, he was in the middle of getting married, so we, he did his piece, and then he asked Gary to come on and do his piece, and it was just a collaborative effort that, that is just so unique and special. I just got a, a nice uh, feedback from the deputy commissioner. Mm -hmm. He just finished his book, and he, he's in love with the character Booterface. The, uh, my bookmark right here, what I was oh, going to ask. You got Booterface? <laughs> Okay. You ready? I think you know what the people want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's filled, as I said, with the highs and lows of basketball, but also the highs and lows of your life. And it is a happy ending because no one would really think when you describe the lows that this guy can bounce back from any of this. And now, any time that I ever speak to somebody and yeah. the name Spencer Haywood comes up, everyone just has the nicest things to say. They go, oh, that was one of my favorite players, that yeah. kind of thing. So it's great to see you coming out on the other side. Did you know outright that it was gonna have a happy, positive ending outright? Was this the book that you intended to write? Yes, because it is, are we recording? Yes, okay. if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, okay, yes, it is the book that I, I envision because my life is an uplifting life. It's a life yeah. story of uplifting others along with uplifting myself. And I can't keep myself uplifted unless I give it away to someone else. And so that's why, I mean, this whole project is about uplifting, but also has a tinge of like, not the old school books, you know, that you normally read. Well, okay, well, this is what we do. This is sort of like got a hip hop flavor to it. It's got a, you know, it's real. And I had to take out a lot of the curse words, but <laughs> cause that was pretty wild in the beginning of it, it was just raw. And so I said, no, I can't do that, you know. Yeah, you definitely have your personality in there. I was curious, cause I just asked, is it the book that you hope to write? Sometimes people write a book and in the midst of that, they kind of have some revelations or the co-author tells them things like, did you know that you, you meant that? Did that happen to you at all? 
Uh, no, no, we, we, we finished the book and I went through all of the edits of the book. Mark went through the edits, Gary went through the edits and we just came out with this good quality book and we had the people at Triumph Books who put in a lot of hard hours pushing and making sure we get it out on time. Uh, it just came out the way it was supposed to come out because I believe in um, in a higher power or something in this universe other than me <laughs> and I'm not it. <laughs> so, so it came out the way it was supposed to come out and, and it's full throated. It is covering every aspect of my life because mm -hmm. again, my life started in ditched slavery. And I know, you know, people say, well, how did that happen in this day and age? You know? Yeah, it was like that in Silver City, Mississippi. And let me remind you that it's not a city and it don't, <laughs> and there's no, there's no silver. It's a population of 375 to 372 people, you know? And it's in the Delta of Mississippi where cotton is king. Yeah. And so as a kid, I had no other desire because I had never been out of my county Mm -hmm. You know, you have county lines. And so I, I went to Belzoni, which is seven miles away, but I hadn't been any further. And so I just, all I saw in my life is just cotton. And then I saw field workers who were like dedicated to the idea that they were the best cotton picker. And I was like, aha, I want to surpass this guy. As a kid, I was thinking like that. And so uh, my brothers and I, we would get up early in the morning before the sun come up and go out and start picking when the cotton is wet. So it weighs more. And, and I was like, seriously, I, I had pushed them aside because I was like, these guys can't beat me. And so I started working with both hands on a row, picking from both, you know, like with both hands, hand and eye coordination because cotton is a thorn. It's like, you gotta be careful. Otherwise your hand is all bloody and everything. So you gotta have delicateness delicateness of picking it and, uh, and 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 I just kept doing it and I, I kept telling everybody in my hometown that I'm going to be the best cotton picker this state have ever witnessed and lo and behold the higher power has got a better plan <laughs> so so when when I you know when I grew up a little little you know got a little taller a little bit bigger mm -hmm. I was pumped and I looked at uh, the guys that I was playing against who wasn't out of the field, it wasn't hand work. They didn't have hand eye coordination. They didn't have, their bodies was not strong because once you fill a sack full of cotton, you got to put it on your back and, and walk all the way back to the trailer, dump it. And you know, you're doing this as a kid, your legs are built, your body is built up. So when I started playing basketball, like, we're going to be in the gym for two hours only two hours <laughs> because I was used to working 12 hours a day. So how do you compute that? And so, and, and later on, when I, when I get to Detroit, I'm looking at all the players I'm playing against and I was just dominating them because I would play, you mm -hmm. know, like I did my classwork, I did all my schoolwork, everything, but I still would play. Uh, we have our practice for two, two and a half hours. And then the coach would say, well, okay, you got the gym. What are you going to do? And I would like practice on stuff for another two hours. And he was like, I never seen a kid like this that loves this game like this mm -hmm. and just love to practice. And it was like the Mississippi cotton field again, that attitude. So it had brought me up to that level. So when, when we got around to the season of kicking off at the Persian High School in Detroit, because I had moved from the South to the North, and uh, we were like, everybody was talking to Detroit Free Press, the Detroit News, everything was like, can this guy from Silver City, <laughs> can he be the one to break the code? The code was that the city of Detroit public school hadn't won a, a class A state championship in 35 years. And my coach, Will Robinson, who had adopted me and along with the family of James and Ida Bell, because my mother wasn't going to move up to 
Michigan because of our church and everything else. Right. So, no, 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 I don't want to live that fast life. So they kept That's pumping me. Fast up. life in Michigan. <laughs> right. Hey, but what's the it's from Tibble City, you know, that's like, whoa. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, right. And uh, so we just was working and working and working, and they were just pumping me up, you know, you could be the one to do it. You could save this city. And I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's what I was going to do with my family in Mississippi. So I started playing real hard, real hard, and we got to the Class A state finals. And there's a picture on my website page, but I haven't put it up yet. It mm -hmm. shows what happened in the final game at Michigan State. We had a jump ball. Mm -hmm. I jumped and tipped it to Ralph Simpson. He kicked it back to me and I was like, well, I'm behind the free throw line and I was had full steam. I said, well, why don't I just dunk it? And because dunking wasn't allowed. Right. So I, I flew all the way from there and I dunked the thing, bam. And the referee says, what shall I do? What shall I do? Shall I put a foul on him or what? No, I tell you what, we're going to do this again. We're going to jump this son of a gun over again. And so, again, the Detroit News caught all of the action again because I did the same thing because Will had told me and the team was like, we got to scare these boys, you know. And <laughs> so I did it again. And lo and behold, that was, you know, the, the turning point for the state championship for the city of Detroit. We came back. And while like everybody's celebrating big things, I just want to go to Top Hat Hamburger stand on, <laughs> on 8 Mile and Ryan, a mile from the school, where we all hung out and ate hamburgers. Well, <laughs> high, school. high school back then, you don't do that. Right. Well, related to that, did you ever see a TV show? It was only on for two or three years called Detroiters. Yes. Yeah. I'm curious if you like that at all, because that showed – Detroit in a loving kind of way. And it also showed it in a way that a lot of the great places have closed up. And one of the great parts about your book is when you talk about your commitment to helping rebuild Detroit. And even the people in the government were going, is this guy crazy? We're not coming back. Is he insane? But see, I got everything from Detroit. Yeah. I came back and played at the University of Detroit. I, I took my pension money. That was like my agent, my accountant and everyone was screaming what are you doing and even mayor coleman young said boy i don't know about that one <laughs> and so he took me down to old black bottom which was you know at that time you know we all at the music scene I, I'm, I'm deep into jazz so oh and, yeah and uh motown and all of the sound so he took me down there and showed me this this grand piece of property up against the elmwood cemetery that he's they wanted to develop and I was like, I am your man. So I put my money in there. And lo and behold, after all these years, since 1991 and 92, when we finished the project until now, it's finally paying off. It is, the city is booming. And I have a grand piece of property. I don't own the whole $19 million worth now. Mind <laughs> you, I, don't want, <laughs> I don't want my relatives coming like, hey, I need more. <laughs> but. Uh, I put, it, I put my money into it. I put my, my, my soul into it, like in everything, you know, because it, it gave me everything. And yeah. Detroit is a place where you have, you have like country folks coming up and you have uh, Europeans from Poland and so on. They come up with all of their different history. And like you can go to Hamtramck, which is right in Detroit. Yeah. And it's just Polish people. And you can go uh, down on, on, on the other side of town. It's all Mexican. Yeah. It's a Mexican town. So it's like Detroit, Detroit, Detroit. It's got these pockets. And so you learn a lot about culture. You learn about food. You learn about the music. And what happened was the music would always blend together from the Motown sound to you have John Lee Hooker who came up from my my part of the country down in the delta he's playing do 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 hey detroit is burning you know so he would go into that kind of sound and then you have the you know motown sound with i bet you're wondering how i lose you know it's like that temptation sound with Smokey and diana ross and stevie so you had all these things and then you go 
and you and you, and you go right down the street there. I would go visit Rudy Tomjanovich, another Hall of Famer from Detroit. Yeah. And we would be playing in Hamtramck. And I'm like, well, what is this music? And it's like poker, it's the sound of Polish <laughs> music. <laughs> so we would like be checking it out. And we would always walk past this Buick place. It's like a Krajinki Buick. And we would say, one of these days, we're going to get a deuce and a quarter, an electric 225 Buick. Because we didn't think about it. You don't get a Cadillac. Because that was like really snooty people's thing. So the deuce and a quarter was like, you know, like our kind of brand. <laughs> so yeah. lo and behold, now we're riding around in Bentleys and stuff. But you know. <laughs> wow. yeah. yeah. Well, you just mentioned the music of Detroit. And of course, Motown. Of course, John Lee Hooker had roots related to all that. But I think that Detroit is the greatest music city in the world because it gave the world Grand Funk Railroad, Alice Cooper, the MC5. You fast forward eventually, Kid Rock, the White Stripes, Eminem and all that. But in the early days, did you ever see... Bob the Bob Siegel. Oh, of I'm course. Just, just saying. <laughs> of course, Bob Seger is to Michigan as Billy Joel is here in Long Island, New York. It's that... Yeah founding father kind of thing, but did you ever get to see Alice Cooper or the MC5 or the Stooges or Iggy Pop, anything like that? I saw Iggy Pop at the Royal Oak Theater, and I thought that was like pretty wild, you know. And uh, I didn't see, I wasn't really that into that heavy side of it. Yeah. I was more, I had just got into the jazz scene, so I, I did catch. I caught Pharaoh Sanders up at Baker's Keyboard. Wow. I caught uh, Miles Davis stepped in one night and just blew with his back to us, you know, and then he turned around and just hit this note. And then one night I, I, was, I was up there from the University of Detroit because the University of Detroit is like a mile away from the jazz scene, the oldest jazz club in the world, Baker's Keyboard. And so we said, man, we're going to go up and check West Montgomery. I wonder if they're going to let us in tonight. Because they would always kid us at the bottom, you know, because like, we were like young guys. And they knew we was on the University of Detroit team. So uh, these guys are going to come up here tonight. We're going to have to put our license in jeopardy and, and stuff like that. So we would come up, and there they are, like, hey, you know. We're going to let him in tonight. So we were sitting there watching Wes Montgomery. He's just playing. And so he had a cigarette in the string. And we were just looking at the string. We had forgot about the music. We were looking at the string. Like, when is that ash going to fall off the cigarette? And it kept getting burning and burning. And we're looking at the ash. And then when he played Bumping on Sunset, it was the song he was playing. He hit the last note, vroom. And the ash fell out. And we were like, Oh, he blew our mind. <laughs> he called George Benson, Earl Clue, all of those guys up there. I was like, you saw the greats, and sounds like you're still seeing the greats aside from COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But another part of your book that's intriguing, we talked about how you reinvest in the city of Detroit, but you also found success in real estate in general. Was Utah the first place that you'd invested? Well, I, I found Utah because I had this this large contract with the Knicks. And so I wanted to uh, um, invest because I, I was being hit by tax revenue and all that stuff. So yeah. uh, my partner in Seattle, because we had been started our investment stuff in Seattle, Washington, and this, this Albertson came available in Utah and the land and everything. So most people didn't have that kind of cash to put down on a property and I just put it down on the property and held on it for years and years and years. And that's how I ended up in Utah on the Albertson supermarket brand. And, and is that, that in Salt Lake City or where is that? Salt Lake City, right in the middle of Salt Lake City. It turned out to be a really good piece of property. And uh, right. I'm so blessed with, I'm so blessed. I'm so lucky. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody was protecting me. <laughs> and you know who. <laughs> Right. So if I recap, you know, the accomplishments that I know about of yours, besides being, you know, a great father and a family man and all that, when we say, well, here's a guy who's found success in real estate, 
a guy who's become a household name as an NBA Hall of Famer and all that. Is there anything that you haven't accomplished that you still hope to one day? Well, I, I hope to get this ruling named for me as it should be, the Spencer Hayward rule, thus the book. <laughs> but it hasn't been named that. So what, what has happened in previous rulings in the NBA, they took the Larry Bird rule, which mm -hmm. is a modified version of my rule, and named it the Larry Bird rule. And Larry don't want the ruling. I've talked with him many times about it. Yeah, that's your rule. <laughs> and, and you have the Oscar Robinson rule, mm -hmm. which is for all of the teams coming together. So this is the only ruling that we have in the NBA, and that is the Spencer Hayward rule. They call it one and done. They call it early entry. They call it the hardship. They call it all of these things. And so that's when the former commissioner and the current commissioner now is saying, yeah, in this, in this movement of Black Lives Matter and Black history and history in itself, it's time we move forward with it. So hopefully Chris Paul, the leader of the Players Association, uh, I know Adam is, is ready to move on it. And Michelle Roberts, I hope all of the people come together and just, I was hoping before this draft come out, but you know, that's another dream and hope that it would be the Spencer Haywood rule. So it would, you know, everybody know that somebody made this sacrifice mm -hmm. so that they can make these millions of dollars. And I paid dearly for it. Yeah, yeah. most people who were the innovator who broke the rule, it usually doesn't turn out well for them, but the book is case in point. It turned out well for you, a combination of hard work, luck, dumb luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's really a story like no other professional athlete I've ever read. Okay, so this is crazy Mark Spears. He said, this is the Black Forest Gump. <laughs> I was like, you know, Forrest was this stupid dude. <laughs> How are you gonna put me? And he said, just read through it. He was clever and he was in. <laughs> and I, I I keep looking at that like, and I went and watched the movie, and I was like, you know, pretty interesting stuff here. But my daughters are like, never. <laughs> the book of Danny Goldberg, he was the president of Atlantic Records and some different record companies, and he managed Nirvana and all that. The name of his memoir was Bumping Into Geniuses, where yeah. He was kind of saying, like, I wasn't that smart. I just knew what to do when I was around people smarter than me. Um, smart people. Duh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Atlantic exactly. Records, oh, my gosh. My, my last words, or my last question besides buy this book yes. and all that is- What's uh, the name of the book? The name of the book, The Spencer Haywood Rule. Uh, yes, it is backwards, but if you then put it into a new mirror, it then looks the correct way. Right. My last question for you, Spencer, is any last words for the kids? Yes. Well, I am a recovering person for the last 30 years. I have no problem in seeing a psychologist or seeing a psychiatrist. Don't let it boil over inside. Get it out. Speak to and get help, get the mental help that you need. Uh, and also, I mean, play, I mean, when you're practicing a sport, mm -hmm. you play it with all of the love and gusto of like your life is, this is your life. You, you gotta pour your life into it so it comes out of you. And that's in your music or whether you're doing shows like yourself, it's, it's, it's the joy of it all. And once you reach that joy, and you'll reach Nirvana. See, I'm going back to Atlantic Records and Seattle, Nirvana. Exactly, the great yeah. music cities. Yeah. And, and, and people have to be reminded, you came from Mississippi before Oprah did, before it was cool to come from Mississippi. Exactly, and guess what? My mom and Oprah is from the same town, Kosciuszko. How deep is this? Yeah. Outrocast.